Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Money Level Show where we think, act, and prosper. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Steve Barton from In It to Win It. How you doing today? I'm I'm doing doing very well, Daryl. Thank you for having me on the show. Yes, yes, we met at the Rule Symposium. I've I've seen your your channel multiple times. We've we've interviewed some of the same guests. Uh, we we talk about some of the same commodities. So I love to get your I'm, I'm enjoying this time so we can we can uh, get your take on some of the things that that I've been talking about with my audience and having your perspective added to this. So appreciate you for uh, coming on. Um, so yeah, so how did you get started in this space? Uh, many many people learned a lot. Like like myself, I learned a lot during twenty twenty and such. Uh, when, when did you get started in uh, investing and wanting to know more about money? And then how did you travel down the road to end up with boring commodities? Yeah, I started when I was really young. I remember opening a retirement account when I was 14. And so I've kind of always been plugged into the uh, stock market, but I, I was always a passive investor, just dollar cost averaging into the S&P 500. And I've always been fascinated with games. And so I started out as a kid with blackjack and then they changed the rules in that to where I couldn't make money at it anymore. So I moved on to Texas Hold'em Poker. And I played that profitably for probably 15 years and even had a podcast on it for seven or eight years. And then COVID hit and we got the 2020 crash and I woke up and I went all to cash. I mean, like if you look at it on the chart now, it looked like I was psychic, but I went all to cash and then I got back in at the bottom and I thought, you know, this was kind of blind luck. I really need to learn what the heck I'm doing here. And so since then, I've been all in. Uh, I hardly even play cards anymore. And I've just been uh, focused on the stocks and uh, commodities, especially, especially in high inflationary um, uh, times, then commodities seem to do quite well. So that's been my focus now for the last three or four years. And I can't get enough of it. It's a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, so you, you were dollar cost averaging into the S&P for a number of years and you know obviously that's passive because you know it's made up of multiple companies is pretty much an etf i don't know if you're buying the spy or, or or what um how did that work out for you oh it worked out great i mean you know i sold right at the at the top and then bought in right at the bottom and i remember my dad saying that uh, he did the same thing throughout his career and he would just you know, when he saw that the market was going down, he would take most of it out and put it into cash. And when you look at those cycles, I was able to capture that uh, at the right moment. And I essentially doubled my account in about a year, year and a half. And uh, so that was cool. But I also realized that I didn't really know what I was doing. And um, I took a, a quick weekend class on stock charts. And that's when I realized like, oh my God, you can forecast this and you can have a pretty good idea of when to buy and a pretty good idea of when to sell. And I have this affinity for pattern recognition where whether it's uh, you know patterns of the way people bet in poker or patterns on a stock chart. And so I just take that you know, talent that I have and that uh, uh, you know, interest and I apply it to commodity stocks and, and, you know, different commodities. And so it's, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And it's a lot easier for me to make money on this than it is playing cards, you know, because from, from cards to make more money, you, you got to move up in stakes. So let's say you double your stakes, you move from like two, five, no limit to five, 10, no limit. You would think since the stakes double, you got to be twice as good, but you actually have to be like four or five times as good. That's how much better the competition gets. But with stocks, you know, unless you're betting on some really small market cap company or doing complex things like, you know, butterfly spreads or something, you know, if you're just betting straight up shares, whether you bet a hundred bucks or you bet 10,000, it takes the same skill set. you know what I mean? But you can make a whole lot more. So um, yeah, I, I just love it. It's uh, profitable, it's fun, and I really dig it. Nice, nice. So I, I, I told everyone I stopped buying like these collectible newsmatic uh, coins and stuff because I, I lost a lot of premium <laughs> premiums buying that stuff. And so now I buy stuff that 
people will actually buy, you know, and it's not like uh, uh, specific to someone's uh, interests uh, in terms of like their favorite cartoon character or whatever. But anyways, I, I bought these uh, these silver dice here. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Oh, cool. You know, so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing my son in craps. So that's that's with these silver dice. That's 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 what I want to do. I, I told my son, I said, we should play craps. And then I bought these silver dice. And uh, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so that's that's good. I, I appreciate you sharing that story. So what are you most bullish on right now? Or actually, before we even get there. What is your outlook on the markets right now? We've, we've been hitting all time highs. The Dow just keeps climbing up. I mean, I, I'm getting notifications from all types of financial sites. Dow record high, Dow record high. And so uh, what, what are you seeing on the front with um, the markets and, and potentially where, where do you see the economy going? OK, uh, I'm going to share my screen here. So I'm a bit of a technical guy and uh Basically, what I see, if we use the kindergarten method of like when the chart starts to look like this, it's uh, probably a little overpriced when it's down here. This is the time that you want to buy. Um, I overlaid here. So basically, this pink line right here is the Fed funds rate, right? And this purple line right here is the Fed's balance sheet. And what happened back here during the great financial crisis in 2008 was they started cutting rates. And the stock market went down during the cutting cycle by 41 percent but then they invented you know they got a lot of tricks up their sleeve you know did anyone see the bank term funding program popping up they invented qe and basically just injected liquidity into the market and it took off like a rocket ship then we fast forward here to 2019 they did the same thing they started cutting rates and initially the stock market went up 13 percent and then it fell by 35%, this is this is that moment that I was saying I caught, you know, I went from there to there and then doubled my account. Um, and from the cutting cycle, from start to finish, it lost 17. But you can see once they started injecting QE, it, it was just off to the races. So I think they're probably going to do something similar this time. I think that as this pink line starts to go down, uh, I think this purple line will probably continue to go down. Maybe there's a little bump, but I think we're going to get a spike in liquidity from the Fed again. And when that happens, this could be off to the races. Maybe David Hunter's right. <laughs> we're going to have a massive melt up uh, if, if we don't already count the one that we've had here. But um, yeah, I think that's kind of the general uh, playbook for uh, uh, for the stock market. I think we might have a little bit of a run up here and then probably a pretty massive sell off. And what are your indicators down there? So is that the RSI and what's Oh yeah, this is the RSI down here. And then this is MACD. Okay, I used MACD. to have stochastic down here too, but it just kind of seemed a little busy and, and I got a lot more from these two. So I tried to simplify it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. I got so many indicators. I'm like, I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to pretty much dial this back. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, so, okay. So the fed, has been whenever the market takes a big downturn, they start um, and the market takes a downturn for different reasons. I mean, so you mentioned the 2008, obviously that was like a huge uh, financial crisis. And then you had the pandemic, uh, yeah. you know, where, where they started really uh, injecting liquidity. And so do you think that is that a significant um, uh, crisis is, is, is uh needs to happen for the fed to pivot and start re um purchasing like government debt and increasing their balance sheets again i think so and i think that's what we're approaching now i i mean uh i really do it, it like when you can't when you just look at the jobs data they don't even count people that haven't had a job for longer than a year they call them discouraged workers and then they're just removed off the uh off the table so, you know, I, I, I don't believe any of the, uh, you know, any of the numbers that the, the government puts out. I, <laughs> gross domestic product, I don't even know if you can look at that thing, the way they fudge everything. You know, I just try to stick to the charts here. And when I find patterns that, you know, I think are going to repeat, then, uh, you know, that, that's mainly what I look at. I don't, I don't pay too much attention to the, the government data or anything, but when you just look at you know, uh, what's generally going on here with inflation, you know, we all know that you can't believe the CPI, 
with the way inflation is ticking up, everyone can feel it. Every time you go to the grocery store, someone's complaining about it in line. I don't think that's going to stop. It may slow down a little bit, but I think that's going to kick off. And especially if they do another round of QE like they did here, then we're really going to be off to the races in inflation and gold and silver and uh, some of these other commodities should do very, very well. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, appreciate you sharing that. Uh, so considering if we have a downturn in the markets, uh, I mean, people like um, Lobo Tigre, he's been on my show uh, a few times, and he's like base metals. He's not really interested in right now because he thinks that there's still going to be some type of recession or hard landing. landing. Uh, what What is your view there in terms of like how these commodities are going to interact with a big downturn in the market? Because for me, I was positioning a lot of cash this year um, and then I started getting into the market to participate in the upside um, because obviously we can't really time time markets and such. And, you know, I thought the Japanese tra uh, carry trade was going to be like, OK, this is maybe this is it where. The market's going to go down significantly. It's still going to sell off, and then it just keeps keeps roaring higher ever since. And so, uh, so what, what's your take, and and how are you viewing base metals such as like copper, uh, you know, rare earths, and and these things that are needed for like a clean energy transition and such? Uh, but how how are you viewing those right now with with the the macro landscape? Okay, uh, maybe I'll start with copper here. Uh, so I kind of ran the same thing for copper, taking into account, um, you know, the, the last uh, cutting cycle. So at least here, the, the chart goes back um, um, to the, uh, what is this, to 2000, so to the dot com. Copper lost 23% during that cutting cycle. Uh, the next one, uh, it lost 10%. And then in 2008, it lost 58% from start to finish. And during the uh, COVID crash here, it lost 19. Uh, but you'll notice after uh, and when they started injecting QE, copper was off to the races. And right here, purple line goes up, QE, copper off to the races. So I think this is what Lobo is talking about. You know, they've kind of reinvented the financial system here when they invented QE and they just start pumping up <laughs> their balance sheet. And I think, I, I don't think this is fundamental investors selling here. I think this is people with like too much margin and they got a cover and uh, they're just liquidating. And on top of that, you know, when you're in a recession and there's less demand for building homes, there's less demand for building cars, there's less demand for infrastructure, you know, copper is going to get uh, copper is going to get hit. So I'm not super into copper right now, although I do have some and I got them at pretty decent price points. So I'm not thinking of selling. Uh, but if we get another crash like this, I will be jumping in headfirst. Um, and, and I think we will. I think we will. But the timing on this is as soon as you start seeing headlines that they are printing QE, like you need to be in because it's, it's shortly after that. You know, you might have a little drop or something, but shortly after that, you're off to the races. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's a uh, that's the confirmation. It's like, OK, you see that when they start doing the QE. Uh, OK, now copper's likely going to run based on based on the the uh, correlation in the chart. I think so. Yeah, I mean, that's what's happened the last two times. Uh, whenever we've felt a recession, they try to delay it in any way they can. So they print their way out of it. And because there's more dollars in existence, it takes more dollars to buy that same pound of copper as it does that barrel of oil or that ounce of gold, you know? Yeah. And it's also I think also when. I mean, this is ultimately the Fed financing the government, um, you know, when they're, when they're buying government debt. They, they, they may, I don't know if they're buying bank debt, uh, like small banks or, or whatnot with, with these QE, when they do QE. But um, I know they're buying government debt and that finances some of the spending. And we saw that in 2020 where we did get a, a boom in, uh, you know, electric vehicles, you, you, you saw like the, the lithium stocks, you know, start to skyrocket and all the EV stocks were, were skyrocketing and everything. I mean, everything was skyrocketing, but I'm, I'm wondering like, OK, if the Fed's financing the government debt and the government is investing in these um, technologies or, you know, uh, or whatnot, um, does that, you know, pretty much like 
is that is that like the catalyst that that kind of how those two relate to each other yeah well they they do things they they come up with these uh you know the inflation reduction act ironically named you know pretty much any any act that the government has if you take the opposite of what that act is that tells you what it really does so they created more inflation and they passed out a whole bunch of money and so now they're they're subsidizing uh you know uranium companies and they're giving them money when they hated them 10 years ago uh, so yeah they basically print dollars and then they give them out to these companies to stimulate and try to influence the economy to go the way they want and then you see you know stock charts that look like that <laughs> you know what, what, whatever happened to nicola stock i don't know if you remember that stock but it was an ev truck company that <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I never followed that. One. <laughs> it, it, it was like it just spiked up to just crazy valuations, and and people were just like you know craving over it. And then um, yeah, it just I don't know if they went bankrupt or what. But yeah, so I, I can definitely see how the printing of money you know relates to these uh, commodities. So what what's your outlook on? Gold and silver. I'm looking at the side. I see uh, s silver. Uh, let's see, gold's at 26.68, and then I saw silver at 32.45. We haven't seen silver at this level in a while, and silver's holding up. I guess I was I was expecting a pullback in gold in terms of like a consolidation because it just it just roared from, you know, it's it's just been roaring like straight up. Right. And um, yeah, I expected a pullback. And so but silver is holding up fairly well um, right now. But we, we can start with gold. OK, so gold here, we've got a long term uh, cup and handle pattern. So just getting kind of into the nerd uh, uh, technical analysis here. Cup and handle looks like that. And then we get a breakout. And so that breakouts happen. And if you measure the upside target on it, uh, basically, if you take the bottom of the cup here to the top of the right part of the cup, it's about a thousand dollars. And you know, that's around two, 2000 there. So if you just project that up, then it's got a measured upside target of 3000. Doesn't have to hit it in the next month or anything, but uh, you know, that's basically the TA on it. Now, if we go to, uh, and, we, and we plot the same thing that we did before, the, uh, the Fed funds rate and, um, their balance sheet, I plotted the last uh, cutting cycles here. So we've got here uh, 1989. And when the Fed started cutting rates here, gold lost 15% from start to finish there. And then we go now here to 2000. And when they cut rates, gold actually went up. Now, when we go to great financial crisis, gold actually fell a little bit and then jumped and made 23% during the start of the rate cutting cycle to the end of it. But here's that purple line again, that QE, and we are just absolutely off to the races. I mean, that is 180 something percent gain from that injection in liquidity. Same kind of thing here during uh, COVID from start to finish, it jumped 16%, but then after they were done cutting and we had that massive injection of liquidity, it, it popped right up. So I kind of expect something similar here for gold. I think they're, I think they're going to do QE. Um, if they don't do QE, then this, this is not going to play out. Uh, but I think it's overwhelmingly likely that we will. And if they do, I think we'll just see a repeat of, of the same pattern. You know, um, here's one charted against the, the gold stocks. So uh, I just took the Huey just because there's more, um, what's the word, like history. Right. So I'll get the RSI out of there, but basically same thing. So here's uh, dot com. Right. Cut interest rates. It goes up by 300 percent. Then they're done the cutting cycle. It goes up another 71 from there. Right. We had pretty volatile there for a year. You know, this doesn't look like much on the charts, but these are like 50, 45 percent pullbacks right there. Right. So there's a lot of trading opportunities right here. And then the next one here in 2007. Great financial crisis, initial stages, it moves up 58%, then from the highs, drops all the way down to 70. Boom, Fed increases their balance sheets, QE, and we move up 330%. Same thing over here, right? 2019, okay, initial run up when they start cutting rates, the gold stocks go up 35%, then they just drop. And this is a hot minute, it doesn't look like uh, very long on the charts, and it isn't, it's only a, a week or two. But if you time this correctly, you drop 44% and then from the bottom here, you made 160. So if we have a, a repeat 
of you know this pattern, I think there's going to be some amazing trading opportunities in gold. And same thing goes for silver here. So here's the silver chart, silver futures. I drew this white line right here at 26 as if that means something. But uh, long term, if we go back here and we go back to um, 1989, the rate cutting cycle, silver lost 34% right here. I shouldn't say it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's delayed in silver, right? So cutting cycle, lost 15, then gained 27, ended down 2%. But after that, we're just on a general trend up. And then now we get into the exciting time here when they start inventing QE. We have a massive run up here in silver, then a 60% drawdown, and then QE, and bam, just a steady climb all the way up. I mean, it went from, what is that, $8 all the way up to 50 I mean, that's a heck of a move. And then just same kind of repeat here with 2019, initial run up, fall of 40%, and then just a massive move here again from down around 12 bucks and then up to 30. And this is where I started to become interested in gold and silver. And this is what caught my attention. And uh, I'm glad it did because I think we're going to get a repeat. So I think gold will move first, uh, but then silver should follow. Uh, do you think this correlation between uh, gold and silver and the Fed funds rate is still exists? I mean, they, they started cutting Obviously, we got gold to all-time highs, but there it's only been a couple of weeks since they've cut. Uh, do you think there's going to be a pullback um, in those those two uh, commodities, or um, or do you think um, or do you think like this this may be uh, decoupled, like this correlation between interest rates and in gold and especially with the macro of central banks buying and and the, the national debt and all of that. I think it has less to do with the Fed funds rate and more to do with the Fed's balance sheet. I'm simply putting the Fed funds rate on here as kind of a timing thing. Does that make sense? Uh, so initially, I think that I think that gold will do well over this cutting cycle. And if they inject liquidity like they've done in the past, then it'll do really well. Uh, and I think silver will do well in this initial cutting cycle and then have a massive drawdown and then do extremely well if they inject uh, liquidity. So I, I think we got a, a little bit more run up here on uh, gold and silver. Although with gold, I think immediately we're probably going to have a little bit of a pullback. Let me clean up this chart a little bit here. I'll get rid of these. And then like if I go to the monthly here on gold, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive. Like, just look at the RSI rate here on the monthly time scale, right? So each one of these bars is a month, and this chart goes all the way back to 1975, right? So right now, we've got an RSI of 79. We'll round up to 80. And that is um, pretty much like anything over 70 in an RSI. Alarm bells should go, be going off in your head like, hey, maybe it's time to sell, right? We're at 79. The last time we were at this level was 2020, and it was at, what is that? Oh, I need this down so I can see it. There we go. It was at uh, 82, and then the time before that was right here, and it was at 60s, high 60s, 74. Right here, it was at 86, and after each one of these, there's a pullback, right? So I think we're kind of approaching that time now. There's only been five of them or so in the last 50 years. And uh, I think we're at one now. So, you know, if, if you bought into gold down here, you know, when it was 1600, sometimes you got to pay yourself, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, take 10, 15, 20% off the table. And if it continues to run, you're happy. And if you have a pullback, you're happy because now you have that cash and you can, you can make another entry point, you know? So I, I could definitely see gold having a sell off here, maybe getting down to like, you know, 24, 2300, there's quite a bit of resistance uh, or support right in that range there. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if these technicals play out and it just starts to roll over a little bit, regardless of the fundamentals of this. You know, um, when, when you see a chart that, you know, looks like that, you usually have a pullback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's too parabolic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a little too parabolic. You might have a super micro computer or NVIDIA type situation, but nah, I'm just joking. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so Steve, thank, thank you for uh, coming on the show and showing us these charts. Where can people find more about the work you do and, um, and all of that? 
Yeah, uh, the show is called In It to Win It, and uh, we're basically in it just to make money. Every Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, we have a show called Monday Market Moves. We do a weekly recap of the commodity markets, uh, what happened the previous week and what I expect to happen for the following week. I interview people such as yourself and experts in the commodities that we follow, Justin Hewn for Uranium, Matt Warder for Coal, Rick Rule, Andy Sheckman, Doug Casey, same guys you're talking to. And uh, I also interview the CEOs of the companies that we own. So it's a lot of fun. I look forward to it every day. If it sounds like you, check it out. We'd love to have you. If you could do me a favor and just put a link down in the uh, show notes to the to the YouTube channel, uh, I'd be grateful. Yes, indeed. I'm going to tag your channel and then also put a link in the description below. Be sure to go support Steve and the work he's doing. Uh, he's doing some amazing work over there. And Steve, appreciate you for coming on. And we definitely got to do this again sometime. Yes. Thank you, Daryl. This was fun.